Okay, so um, yeah, so my title for the talk is Scheduling Array Operations. And I will cover it through three different topics, which are static semantics, something called rank polymorphism, and then finally the scheduling part. And uh, these are all related in the sense that the static semantics try to give some correctness guarantees and kind of like give some guidance to, uh, to the later optimization stages. And then rank polymorphism is this a language construct which or a property which you can also find from some natural languages. Uh, Finnish has it, so if you sometimes find uh, some phrase which means many different things depending on the context, that's rank polymorphism. But generally this is a bit of a challenge to then uh, integrate with the uh, static semantics part. And then finally, uh, the scheduling part is something that given these two properties, we can then achieve this and make uh, uh, computation go a bit faster. And then the, uh, I would say that the big picture or kind of like to get an idea where I'm coming from is also relevant to see that I'm more from the functional programming end of things. So in that uh, very nice picture, you might see that there's Haskell. It's in the uh, combinator languages. And what I'm really trying to do is take some ideas from Haskell and uh, similar languages and push it towards the Iversonian languages. And the general thing here is that it's often said that when APL programmers, they write APL, they see a lot about their program. They, they kind of like understand, understand uh, how, how it works with a matrix or with a vector and so forth. But for the computer, it's not really as easy. But that's then what my research is about. It's about revisiting uh, what the computer can really understand or whether it could see the same things as the uh, APL programmer does. And then there's an example about uh, then how it also, some of these things tie together with the previous uh, example from Rodrigo. So basically I've taken the MX uh, example here and then just put some sample data through. And the relevant part here is to see that you, it may, these boxes are very useful in the sense that when you then think about GPUs and these new multi-core uh, computers, these usually rely and build upon, upon these uh, data structures like matrices, vectors, and scalars. And you can see it kind of the same story happening here in the sense that you could take a single box and consider it an individual uh, computer core doing its task independently of the others. So this is one of these remarks that are, are, is very relevant to my research as well. And then more generally, when we think about this modern hardware with multi-core uh, computers, there's a quite clear separation about how we compute something. And this is the red path of the triangle. So there's something called workgroups and subgroups and invocations and stuff like this. These are like vector instructions. Not that interesting, but it all builds upon the data structures, which is the blue path. And the path in which APL programmers really excel at is about thinking their uh, problems from these kind of data structure viewpoints. And essentially, the idea is that this is, this, this is a pyramid. It, the, everything builds on top of the data structures. If you get the data structure right, then it's much easier to build on or use these new hardware features uh, in kind of like going up in the hierarchy. And also, it's very nice that in the GPU world, they have kind of like come up with some of the uh, similar APL operations for their own. Or it's in the instruction sets. For example, here's an instruction for the uh, group non-uniform float max operation, which basically takes a reduction and finds the maximum value in that scope. But the, uh, 
problem here is that, of, first of all, it's adding the type float in here. And then you have to give it some extra information about these subgroups or work groups and then stuff like that. So it requires a compilation step to be integrated with the, with the uh, data structure that APL programmers are usually more uh, comfortable with. And the compilation part really gets to the point like where my APL story really comes into play. I, I initially learned about APL in 2018, seemingly through this uh, PDF book called Elementary Algebra from uh, Iverson. But then it took me some, of th some time to really look into it. But then I really uh, kind of like fell in love with the way the IDE works, that you try things out and you see how, how these uh, operations react and what kind of data you get out. And then my research was also highly influenced by Aaron's work regarding GPUs and then thinking more or thinking APL more as a modeling language for parallel computers. And then, yeah, my first APL program happened to be this random forest traversal algorithm. And a little bit more about it. So the idea was that I took some uh, Python Skikit code, so it's a machine learning library, and I modeled it in APL. And then I took that APL code and I translated it to something called Spear5. And Spear5 is a parallel GPU assembly code. And I did this manually. And then I ran this Pure 5 code on something called Vulkan. It's just the way you execute uh, GPU code on modern hardware. And the, it ended up being that the, uh, this approach improved on the baseline from the Python, which was now actually being uh, translated into something called Cython. So it was actually running C. But uh, yeah, the, uh, the GPU approach worked here. And uh, I thought that there's a bit more to look into here. Like if, if this kind of like approaching the problem from a perspective that really uh, renders itself well for parallel computing can also help others then how to really go about it. And more generally, you could think that the findings from the GPU world that I found was that there's, a, there's the separation about the what we compute. So, uh, I, I really feel like APL programmers already think about the, uh, their, their programs from this perspective that renders itself very well to multi-core devices. And as you saw from the previous slide, the, the data structures live there very at the bottom of this hierarchy. So the people who write these or design these uh, GPU hardware and so forth, really want all programs to think about their software from this perspective, that that's not really the case in uh, many other languages. But also the how we compute things is something also like, uh, it's uh, something I had to look into and kind of like figure out, but I, I, fi I figured it's machine solvable in the sense that it always builds from the data representation. If you if you use a matrix or if you use a vector, then that always affects the things that build on it. So it's very important to get the low level stuff right. So then the challenge is that can we really automate the, how we execute the uh, array programs? And that gets us to academics. So the hot topics in academics and on the uh, topic of APL the first one is called static rank polymorphism. It sounds exciting. And it's, a, a, it's, a, it's studied at the Northeastern in the US as a Remora and then as a Futhark in Copenhagen. And then Google also researches it through this language called DEX. The, usually these languages then apply something called dependent types to help out the language. And dependently typed languages exist as Idris, which is developed at St. Andrews, and then as a granule, which is uh, developed at University of Kent. And moreover, the academics don't really talk about APL. They, they, they seem to think about functional programming and the application of functional programming on something called tensor computation. So for example, an example of this is something called halide from, I think that's how it's pronounced, from MIT and Adobe. 
But, and in more general sense, I think there's a very big push also from the academical side of things to think about parallel computation and how to make that easier for uh, new people to use this uh, new computation hardware, such as GPUs. And for that, you have a lot of industry examples. You have CUDA and Legate from NVIDIA. Then you have languages like MATLAB, Julia, libraries like NumPy, TensorFlow, and so forth for yeah, usually accelerating machine learning applications. But then, then we get kind of like into the software bug of things, or like, kind of like what, what I then spend a lot of time thinking about, and one of that is recursion. So kind of like solving the, how we can automate the execution to happen in an optimized way uh, requires us to really understand some absurd cases or in the sense that if you, if you would be just uh, following this waterfall, you might think that if you're on the stream that the waterfall is correct and it makes sense. But it requires uh, you to really step out from the waterfall and from the stream to see that this waterfall makes no sense and it's maybe even a bit hard to look at. But uh, the point here is that from the perspective of a programming language, uh, it is very hard to figure out or build up anything in an automated way if it's in the stream. It has to have some way of looking at the program from more abstract point of view to understand how to build different uh, structures or to find bugs and so forth. So essentially, uh, the idea is that we have to have approaches to apply constraints into how these programming languages figure things out. And that's the uh, uh, art of uh, abstract interpretation that is really needed in this case. And, and one, one way to apply abstract interpretation is something called types. And, uh, but I, I really want to present types as a, it's not something like a float versus an integer or a string versus an integer. We are talking about these bit more academical ideas about uh, ownership, uh, direction, and multiplicities. And these can be used to model new, new kind of relations with software, but also then to avoid these kind of like waterfalls or absurd waterfalls from being created by the programmer. So something is, well, first of all, like ownership is created by linear types. So I have some examples in Finnish, since I also find it interesting that Finnish has suffixes which uh, model most of these uh, uh, type system features. And I guess that if you don't like types a lot, then you should probably not learn Finnish. But, uh, but yeah, so basically linear types just tell ownership that whether you have some object and the object owns something. Dependent types then apply direction to something. So from a dog, you could have like a, a, a hair from a dog. Then you, if, if you have such thing, then you kind of, it's kind of like implied that the hair and the dog have some relation together. And then quantitative types tie multiplicity into ownership. So this is use, useful from an array programming perspective in the sense that uh, you then, you can think about, for example, vectors. If you have four valued vector, then you could in a type system level tell that those values have to be used a certain amount of time, or then you can model how some data transfers have to happen. So these are kind of like this, uh, maybe a maybe bit more advanced uh, approaches to type systems than what people usually consider types to be. And now we can really take these types and think about what would a typed waterfall be. And now that the types express these properties, the idea is that we should start asking questions by like, what is the direction of the water or uh, where does the water come from or can the water be reused? But the, but the big idea is that really thinking about types as a way to apply constraints into building, autom building software in an automated way is the main point we are going for here. 
And then the big idea is that these constraints can then guide uh, the uh, software to read solutions that might be helpful for us. But before we go into examples how that really works is then we are also taking a quick look at computers. So there's this called language trilemma. So basically it's a, another triangle and the idea is that there's three properties. There's performance, productivity and generality. And you can really only pick two of those things. So you could say that CUDA and Futhark are very productive and performant languages, whereas something like Python or MATLAB and Julia are more focused on the productivity and generality perspective. And the idea is that there's really, if there would be something which has all these three things, it would be a hammer because everything would look like a nail. But that's usually not the case. It's almost like it tells more about you and your preferences rather than the programming language actually have, having all these properties. And when I think about APL, I think that APL is something we have cut off generality from. And this comes from the viewpoint that it only applies to data structures which are uh, multidimensional arrays. But there's also something nice that we can have about this. If we cut away, if we just focus on these arrays, then we can focus more on the productivity and the performance aspect of such language. So then it comes down to this property called static rank polymorphism. And what does that really even mean? It's a, well, the static in there means the kind of like abstract interpretation of the program. So information about what we can know about the program before we even start it. And Kurt Gödel has this incompleteness theorem and it's basically what you could think about or think of it in this context is that it's very hard to interpret even simple programs. So now that we have cut off a lot of the generality and just focused on arrays, then we can kind of uh, get a little bit more leeway into applying uh, nicer things. And then for rank polymorphism, it's this example which I have for Finnish, is that it adds this value-based context to the language interpretation. So in Finnish, if, you, if someone tells, tells you that kuusipala, you don't really know what it means um, until you have the bigger context of what is happening. And this is also true for APL in the sense that you can have semantically the same looking program for matrix, vector, and scalar, and it might be correct for all of those. But what it really does depends on what you give to it. So this is the rank polymorphism in action. And then we can go into why is this uh, useful. Then the point is that it simplifies something called parallel programming. And you might know about accumulators and divide and conquer, but this is like another point that doing Doing algorithms in dividing and concurring is very hard when you, in some sense, don't know the amount of troops you have. So you have to have some way of representing resources. And GPUs and new these hardware devices have very, very many different kind of properties in them. And uh, it's hard to really consider all of those cases. So it kind of like asks for more dynamic scheduling to happen. But something very nice APL has is that it abstracts away the execution strategy of the algorithm. So it doesn't, when you do like a reduction, you don't really know if, if, the, if it's going one number in like one number in a row or whether it's actually taking the bigger array and put it into smaller pieces. So because APL works this way, then you can also create a compiler or some kind of other mechanized way which which does something uh, in an automated way so that you could implement these nice divide and conquer algorithms without introducing any changes to the language itself. So the putting it together is kind of like, well, the challenge is that understanding what, the, what, what kind of shapes does data may have. And then the idea is that once we have enough constraints, whether that would be coming from a, a type system or so forth, then it builds on top of the data structure such that uh, once that's done, the constraints can guide the software to find the correct solutions for picking up these uh, another parts of making the execution happen. So basically, uh, you, can, you can achieve this uh, using the safe analysis and employing new type systems. 
but the APL way still remains. You still start with the data, and the, the other stuff comes after it. So shape analysis, again, like practical and theoretical purposes, practicality-wise, it's nice that you can do work splitting. Background is that it's nice to have a single program work for any GPU. Theoretical is that we, we are really asking what we can know about programs beforehand and how we can generalize this information. And in, 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 like a, as a, a conclusion from this part is that parallelism is much easier with abstract interpretation and once you know your troops in some sense. So now we kind of like cover each of these three parts and then the looking at what do we get once we combine this all. And then it takes to this takeaway from here is that uh, I, I, th I really think that APLers already think about programming in the way that the new hardware systems really wants you to do it. But really the language also has to see some things which seem obvious to the programmer. And this is very hard to implement unless you have some ways to constrain the amount of states or kind of like what is possible to happen in the language. But this way, on the other hand, it's also possible to use the types as a something that builds on top of the APL arrays. So the big thing is that not really, that take the types as a thing that could help our life and not the other way around. And then if, if you accept types in this uh, sense, then you can get performance optimization on multi-core systems. And then on the other hand, you can have more like automa automatic distribution of the execution of these algorithms by doing automatic splitting up of the data structures. And that's it, thanks. <laughs>